So, uh, good evening, doctors. I am Dr. Stalin on behalf of Shield Healthcare, welcoming you for today's webinar. Uh, the topic for today's session is uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. I welcome all the delegates and I request them to post their queries in the comment box so that we can have a short uh, QA session at the end of the presentation. Now it's time to introduce our eminent speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Madhavi, ma'am. Ma'am has completed her. Yes, oh, and madam is a consultant gynecologist, obstetrician, and laparoscopic surgeon practicing at Marath Pali Secondary Birth. Madam is also a consultant at Ajita Multi Fertility Hospital, Basan Shahani Hospital, and Yashoda Hospital Secondary Birth. Uh, madam has more than 22 years of experience in practicing and consulting. Madam has done a fellowship in uh, laparoscopy from World Laparoscopy Hospital, New Delhi, aggregated to uh, WALS. Madam is also a life member of various societies like FOXI, IMA, and IAG. A special field of interest is high risk pregnancies, vaginal surgeries, infertility, and laparoscopic surgery. With this introduction, I welcome you, ma'am. And, ma'am, before going to the session, uh, we will be playing a one minute video for our Shield Connect web page, ma'am. So, Chitra will play a video, ma'am. So thank you, ma'am. So Shield uh, Connect is a new initiative of our Shield Healthcare, ma'am. So it contains uh, various uh, blogs given by various doctors. And madam, we have a separate page for uh, our speakers, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ma'am, we have a separate page for our speakers and all the details of the speakers will be available our, at our website, ma'am. And the webinars conducted by the doctors, the particular speaker will be updated in our website map and we have a separate topic for uh, our PCOS awareness uh, program so you can find uh, videos of uh, various doctors speaking about their uh, views on PCOS in various regional languages so you can see uh, the short videos of uh, doctors giving their opinion on PCOS in various uh, regional languages map and we have the separate page for uh, webinars. So all our webinars are being conducted through our Shield Connect web page only, ma'am. So you can find the details of all uh, upcoming webinars. 
and uh, all the past webinars are also up uploaded in our uh, seal connect web page now so we have another one column for our our leaders so we have more than 220 leaders supporting our uh, seal connect web page uh, by giving their opinions and their feedbacks and through their webinars so i request the participants to uh, go through our web page and uh, make it useful thank you ma'am and over to you ma'am Thank you. I congratulate uh, Shield Connect team uh, on uh, creating such a great awareness amongst the doctors. And uh, I once again welcome all the delegates in this uh, wonderful webinar. I hope we are we are all uh, due for our second dose of the vaccination and we are done with the second dose of the vaccination and uh, hopefully we look forward to this 2021 a very eventful year I welcome you to this uh, webinar of uh, webinar on premature ovarian insufficiency. Uh, I hope I do justice to the time spent on this uh, uh, on this webinar and the uh, wonderful awareness which Shield Connect is creating. So, premature ovarian insufficiency. Uh, uh, this is a really uh, uh, very less discussed, less discussed, and uh, definitely the woman has her own uh, untold story uh, in agony and what all she's going through. Uh, they really don't come forward to share with their uh, uh, symptoms and all, and she accepts it as her uh, fate. So here, it's a good opportunity by Shield Connect on uh, uh, sharing this important topic and I specifically chose to talk on this premature ovarian insufficiency as uh, day by day uh, I, I see more and more uh, women facing this situation and uh, we need we all need to join hands together to create awareness about this now what is this exactly uh, ovarian reserve Ovarian reserve is the functional potential of the ovary that reflects the number and the quality of the remaining follicles and oocytes in both the ovaries at a given age. Now, we all understand that the number of follicles are responsible for the release of the estrogen and the hypothalamic pituitary axis that is maintained. And that's how the, uh, the estrogen which is released that protects the woman against a uh, lot of uh, uh, morbid conditions as to cardiovascular, bone health, and with the more of the career uh, pursuing and uh, late marriages, and uh, discordance after the early marriages, second marriages are more common nowadays. With all these things, they, the uh, women are getting into uh, their uh, following their family later in uh, life, later in life. And that is how, why the ovarian reserve is so very important. Environmental and developmental origins of ovarian reserve. So let us understand what is exactly uh, the number of follicles, how at birth during conception, the number of follicles are almost, that is maximum at 18 to 22 weeks post conception. And as the green, uh, the green uh, line shows, as with age, the number of uh, ovarian reserve that goes on decreasing with age. And now uh, that is the normal curve which they follow. That is around 40 to 50 years, the reserve goes down. But in few of the cases, the dotted ones with the blue line, the lower ovarian reserve set prenatally. So there are few of the conditions because of the 
you know epigenetic uh, mechanisms the preset prenatally the number of follicles the reserve is less and that's how the post uh, the postnatal decay happens and that's how the number of uh, the ovarian reserve that declines much more earlier now the lower trajectory of the ovarian reserve during adverse postnatal environmental or the nutritional challenge now end of the fertility age of the last child end of fertility age at the last child that all starts uh, you know that uh, happens earlier and that's how she sets into irregular cycles and goes into a transition menopause and menopause the environmental and the developmental origins of the ovarian reserve prenatally it affects at the same time there are adult exposures as well now the prenatal exposures like the general environmental agents like pesticides plasticizers cigarette smoking during antenatal time ethnicity economic factors because of the low uh, uh, women coming from low socioeconomic uh, strata uh, they have their nutritional deficiencies and uh, cognitive function androgen pcos so these all factors affect prenatally and that's how it has impact on the ovarian reserve at the same time once the the child the woman is born the female is born again they have the adult exposure like underweight overweight obesity nutritional smoking so alcohol all these things again have a uh, that comes under the environmental origin of the ovarian reserve so all these factors prenatal and the adult exposure that works on the ovarian reserve endocrine disrupting chemicals these chemicals they have affinity towards many of the receptors like ahr and this binds to the dioxin response elements and uh, at the same time estrogen receptors and uh, you have the rapid response involving the membrane associated er so all these uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals they have strong affinity towards the estrogen response elements and they bind with these receptors affecting the later affecting the ovarian reserve so what the study shows that was a study was done in 2014 so evidence summarized indicating that smoking hastens the onset of the menopause by as much as 1 to 2 years smoking accelerates the development of diminished ovarian reserve as Uh, evidenced by poor FSH response during the CC challenge test and active passive smoking all these conditions have a strong evidence to prove that yes it does have a poorer ovarian result now description what is the key question now there are different words being coined but uh, uh, which are there is a little change in the interpretation what should this condition be called as is it premature ovarian failure primary ovarian failure premature menopause premature ovarian insufficiency that is the uh, key word today on which we are going to talk what exactly the premature ovarian failure that means uh, below 40 years the female stops menstruating the primary ovarian failure this uh, in this the woman uh menstruates but at the same time the fsh rises the estradiol goes down and that's what is the primary ovarian failure pof is defined as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism with the cessation of menses before the age of 40 years women affected almost about 1 to 3% experience this uh, uh uh pof the incidence is lower in younger women fsh is about 20 to 40 milli international units per ml in the presence of amenorrhea has been proposed to define ovarian failure primary ovarian insufficiency that is a, a alternative to pof in which the a, fsh is more than 12 to 15 milli international units per ml in women 
less than 40 years with regular cycles, the ovaries are unlikely to respond to the stimulating agents such as gonadotropins, recombinant, and the HMGs. POF may become pregnant spontaneously, uh, but the likelihood is very low. They present with primary amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, presence or absence of autoimmune disorders, association with chromosomal abnormalities such as Turner syndrome. These two words are actually synonymous to prevent unnecessary confusion. Now, what we got to know around 18 to 22 weeks of the fetal life, we have the maximum number of the germ cells. But in Turner's, what usually happens by the time, by the time from the early conception till the time 18 to 22 weeks, the number of follicles go down. And once she reaches puberty, there's hardly any follicle left. Now, Ishri recommendations, premature ovarian insufficiency, what should this condition be called? The term premature ovarian insufficiency should be used to describe this condition in research and clinical practice. Premature ovarian insufficiency is a clinical syndrome defined by loss of ovarian activity before the age of 40 years. POI is characterized by menstrual disturbances that could be amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea with raised gonadotropins and lower estradiol. The prevalence, as I told, it's about 1% to 2% of the general population. Before this, we just go through the follicular dynamics in physiology. Now, during the life stages, 20 weeks almost about 7 million uh, primordial follicles are seen at birth, which is left to one. And by puberty, we have the follicles left as three lakhs, premenopause below 1,000, and by menopause, the follicles are zero. So the follicle, the atresia of the follicles happens at much faster rate. And for ovulation, we have the reserve only 400 to 500 follicles. Stages of folliculogenesis, gonadotropin independent, and we have the gonadotropin dependent. Now the primordial follicle, primary, preantral, these are all, then slowly they become atritic. Now gonadotropin, under the influence of the gonadotropins, the follicle grows, the antral follicle grows, and that carries on for the ovulation and the possible the number of follicles, they reduce, atresia increases, and there's altered follicular maturation. POF uh, causes are contribute almost 65% contributed by idiopathic, familial genetic 20%, autoimmune 10%, and X chromosome abnormality deletion translocation 5%. Etiology. Most of them are metabolic, autoimmune, idiopathic, iatrogenic, infectious, genetic, environmental. Now, the primary causes are chromosome abnormalities, X chromosomes, Down syndrome, FSH receptor gene polymorphism, enzyme deficiency like galactosemia, 17 alpha hydroxy deficiency, autoimmune diseases. These are the primary. Secondary causes are chemotherapy, radiotherapy, bilateral oophorectomy, or surgical menopause, hysterectomy without oophorectomy, and, and also uterine artery embolization and infections. Idiopathic, there is a really uh, no reason explained as to uh, why there is increased rate of oocyte apoptosis. And uh, it is really very unfortunate. So those category groups come under idiopathic. There's reduced complement of oocytes in the ovaries at birth or there is accelerated atresia. However, ultrasound and ovarian biopsy have not been useful in prognostication of future ovulation and fertility. There's no way that uh, we can find out that which, wom which woman is getting into 
POI. Genetic in primordial follicle oocyte is surrounded by granulosa cells, which provide growth factors to the oocyte. Mutations in FOXL2 gene lead to defect in granulosa cell activity, leading to POF. Isolated gene defects in FSH R gene also plays role. So this is how the autosomal involvement gives rise to reduced gene dosage and non-specific chromosome defects that impair meiosis. There is decrease in pool of the primordial follicles, increased atresia of ovarian follicles due to apoptosis or failure of the ovarian maturation. Another entity is autoimmunity. Genetic or environmental factors might initiate immune response, HLA antigens, cytokines, and possibility of disease-specific therapy to prevent further autoimmune ovarian damage in POF patient with proven autoimmune etiology. Induced conditions of uh, POI, irradiation, chemotherapy, smoking, increased use of gonadotropin stimulation, any surgery on ovary, PCO drilling, and above all, interestingly, hysterectomy too. Galactosemia, how does this cause uh, uh, POI? There is deficiency of the enzyme, which in turn causes intracellular accumulation of galactose metabolites or deficient glycosylation action. And this causes increase in the number of ogonia apoptosis. For most women, it is unexpected and distressing diagnosis with unpleasant symptoms, loss of fertility due to absence of the follicles, inability of remaining follicles to respond to stimulation. So there are two aspects of POI. One is the woman gets into uh, the number of follicles. We, on a day-to-day -day, uh, practice, also nowadays we are seeing women uh, 26 years, 28 years, even below 30 years, we hardly see follicles in them. So it is very distressing. So uh, women is getting hardly uh, once or twice uh, her menses in a year. At the same time, even if she has the follicles, those follicles are resistant to the stimulation. Now, primary amenorrhea, you... Uh, grossly streak go ovaries are seen. Secondary amenorrhea, small ovaries without growing follicles. Hypoestrogenism, the estradiol, the levels are below 50 picogram per ml. Hypergonadotropism is FSH is above 40 milli international units per ml. Now, irregular, how the woman goes through her cycle of uh, presentation of uh, POI is like they get irregular or they skip their menses because of which uh, there is decreased sexual desire, hot flushes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, irritability, and poor concentration. So she gets into a premature menopausal symptom. How do we diagnose uh, POI? That is of Really, there's nothing like one marker as to, yes, this woman is going to, there's nothing that we, we can predict as to which woman is getting into POI or there's no specific test mentioned as to, yes, these group of patients are to be categorized under POI. But the guidelines say the diagnosis of POI is based on the presence of menstrual disturbances and biochemical confirmation. Although proper diagnostic accuracy in POI is lacking, so what it says is oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea for at least four months, elevated FSH levels above uh, 25 international units per, per liter on two occasions four weeks apart. So let us be a very specific oligomenorrhea at least four months and FSH values above 25 international units per liter, four weeks apart, two readings, four weeks apart. 
primary ovarian insufficiency is also seen in adults, adolescents, and young women. Now, what is the diagnosis and initial evaluation of POI in adolescent women, girls? Menstrual irregularity for at least three consecutive months, FSH and estradiol levels to be tested uh, a month apart, prolactin thyroid function test. If the diagnosis is unconfirmed, then we need to go on for the karyotype and other uh, genetic, uh, uh, we have to do the genetic karyotyping and adrenal antibodies, 21 hydroxylase, immunoprecipitation or indirect immunofluorescence and last of all, pelvic ultrasonography. Now, what are the known causes of POI and how should they be investigated? First, we have the genetic chromosomal karyotyping, the most common Turner syndrome. So we refer them to endocrinologist, cardiologist, and genesis. We need to have a multidisciplinary approach. Test for Y chromosomal material, fragile X autosomal genetic testing, and uh, in this situation, we need to take help of the geneticist. And uh, at the same time, we need to do the thyroid TPO antibodies and the, they need to be tested every year. Fragile X premutation in women. Normal, we have five to 44 repeats and intermediate 45 to 54 repeats, pre-mutation 55 to 200 repeats. Now full mutation. Now this female is going to pass on the fragile X to subsequently to her daughters, full mutation more than 200 repeats. Now what is the reason of health concern in female fragile X? Like they are more at risk of premature ovarian insufficiency, menstrual dysfunction, early menopause, and infertility. Obstetric point of view, they are more uh, into diazogetic uh, twinning, risk of having an offspring with the premutation or full mutation. Psychiatric anxiety, major depression, sleep disturbances, postpartum depression, endocrine, thyroid dysfunction, hypertension. Complications from hyper, hypoestrogenism, they are with the impaired bone health, cardiovascular morbidity, sexual dysfunction, neurologic, fragile X are associated with tremors, ataxia, neuropathy, and fibromyalgia. These are the reasons why uh, these women need to be picked up and we need to protect them from the uh, hypoestrogenic complications in their life. POI, these have been divided into disorders leading to ovarian insufficiency, ovarian follicle dysfunction, and we have ovarian follicle depletion. The follicles are there, but they are not responding to the CC or HMG or recombinant. So that is what the follicles are there, but there is dysfunction. So most common because of the uh, mutations, receptor mutations, of FSH, LH, and enzyme deficiencies, autoimmunity. These are one of the luteinization of the graphene follicle. These are the commonest reasons of follicle dysfunction and follicle depletion, mainly because of the, uh, you have the gonadal dysgenesis, other syndromes, and spontaneous accelerated follicle loss, follicle loss because of no reason really what is a, um, that, they get into oocyte apoptosis. Genes associated with primary ovarian insufficiency, known human X chromosome located functionally relevant genes. So there are different genetic uh, uh, causes why uh, they get into POI and other gonadal dysfunction uh, due to cytotoxic drugs. They are at high risk, medium risk, and low risk. Genetics of POI, new developments and opportunities have been uh, you know, picked up because of the genetic reasons. So now what does the data show for POI? 
the value of screening tests. So we come across the different uh, tests that FSH 10 to 20, AMH 0.22.7, antral follicle coin count 3 to 10, inhibin B, these are the levels which have been shown to label them as uh, uh, POI uh, associated with autosomal abnormalities. Cytogenetic analysis have been done and different various uh, uh, genetic, uh, uh, you know, permutations, all these have been karyotype abnormalities have been seen in POI women. Now, risk of conservative management in women with ovarian endometrium. What does it say? That this condition, the possibility of ovarian cancer developing later in life is more troublesome because it is life-threatening condition. This risk can be effectively prevented by postponing surgery. So what it says is if a woman has endometrioma, then we should not delay it further as to, uh, you know, you try out with different cycles, but she doesn't get, she from uh, uh, pillar to post, the woman has been uh, running around with uh, uh, different uh, treatments and she's been put on ovulation inducing uh, agents. And uh, then finally, she reaches the infertility center with uh, where she's uh, subjected to surgery or the medical treatment where they realize the reserve has really gone very, very low. So the take home message in this is that uh, once the endometriosis is uh, detected, we should give the woman an option as to, yes, she should go in for ARTs so that she gives birth to a, a healthy child because these are the women who are going, getting into POI and uh, uh, so ART has to be uh, advised before they are subjected to any endometrioma surgeries. So this is what the take home message, the available evidence on the risk of conservative management does not support systematic surgery before IVF in women with small ovarian endometriomas. Now, once we get into the uh, endometriosis surgeries, so when we peel out the ovarian cyst and the chocolate cyst, the whole milieu, the ovarian milieu, peels off the healthy follicles along with the uh, chocolate cyst. So we lose a lot of follicles in that way. So it is always, uh, you know, in favor of women uh, to get into ART before getting into uh, one lifetime endometriosis surgery. Now, endometriosis-related infertility, ovarian endometrioma per se is not associated with presentation for infertility. So we have uh, infertility, ART without surgery, and the other group is requiring surgery. Now, now in one group, so one group is dealt with the ART and the second group, they present with pelvic pain. Even if they have completed with their family life, they present, they have not come, started with their family life and uh, reproductive um, uh, activity, but they present with pelvic pain, pain. So what exactly what they say is the medical treatment before surgery, fertility preservation before surgery, and that's what, ART first and then subject them to surgery. So they can be given an option as to, uh, you know, for she can uh, freeze her oocyte cryo uh, preservation of the oocytes and uh, freeze her uh, oocytes and then uh, subject her to surgery. That is what the, the objective of these proposed strategies are first to avoid unnecessary surgical procedures, and especially those contributing to damage the ovarian reserve. Second, to perform endometriosis surgery at the appropriate time. Ideally, patients should undergo surgical treatment only once in their endometriosis life. In particular, use of hormonal 
medical treatment in patients with no immediate desire to conceive with or without infertility allows delaying the surgical intervention at best time. Similarly, the place of ART in the treatment sequence should be carefully considered. Currently, too often proposed at the end of the infertility story. So that's what happened. She keeps on trying with the ovulation inducing agents. And by the time all her follicles have become atritic, she has she gets into a premature ovarian insufficiency. So uh, give a woman, give with these women an earlier option of ART before subjecting them to the surgery. Ovarian reserve testing. Risk factors for diminished ovarian reserve, advanced reproductive age, older than 35 years, family history of early menopause, genetic conditions, 45X, mosaicism, FMR1, fragile X, premutation carriers, and conditions that can cause ovarian injury like endometriosis, pelvic infection, previous ovarian surgery, oophorectomy, history of cancer treated with gonadotoxic uh, therapy or pelvic irradiation, history of medical conditions treated with gonadotoxic therapies, smoking, these are the conditions. So these women have, uh, they have, uh, they are at risk of uh, reduced uh, ovarian reserve. Now, testing and interpreting measures of ovarian reserve so what it says is that uh, there is no screening test that can be used alone to accurately measure the residual pool of primordial follicles and predict a woman's reproductive lifespan. Now, anti-mullerian hormone, what it says, AMH is usually uh, uh, assessed, estimated whenever a woman is subjected to the fertility treatments. So assessing, it helps in assessing in utero effects on ovary, impact of childhood disease, assessing periods, PCOS, hypogonadism, premature ovarian insufficiency, ovarian surgery, granulosa cell tumors, pre and post cancer treatment, menopause, family planning, IVF. So AMH plays a key, uh, you know, marker for finding out it is one of the uh, markers for testing the ovarian reserve what does the data show for primary ovarian insufficiency now why are we so concerned about these we need to pick up these women getting into poi why are we so much uh, concerned that uh, these women should be uh, you know, picked up and uh, diagnosed who are heading towards premature menopause. Now, this, the women is at risk of cardiovascular system, impaired endothelial function, increased triglycerides, cholesterol, and LDL. Now, apart from cognitive dysfunction, autoimmune thyroid disease risk, bone health, there is osteopenia, osteoporosis, and increased fracture risk hypoestrogenism and at the same time, which is leading to infertility. Urogenital symptoms, vaginal dryness, vaginal irritation, and itching, sexual disorders. So they are at increased risk of premature deaths. So this is the sequelae of POI. Now the deaths are mainly because of the cardiovascular, uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Long-term consequences of premature ovarian failure, infertility, bothersome menopausal symptoms, then you have psychological distress and depression, potential early decline in cognition, decreased sexual and general well-being, autoimmune disorders, osteoporosis, ischemic heart disease, increased risk of mortality, dry eye syndrome, increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus or pre-diabetes mellitus. Consequences of 
life expectancy. POI is associated with increased risk of premature death from cardiovascular disease. Both iatrogenic and natural menopause are implicated. Now, sequelae of POI, what are the consequences of POI for life expectancy? Menarche, then around 20 to 25 years, first pregnancy, and the woman gets into POF around 35 years. There are other, uh, you know, surgical premature menopauses there. 45 years, she faces uh, uh, thyroid disorders and metabolic, and she's heading towards carcinoma breast, hypertension, metabolic uh, syndrome, and uh, then uh, she is at risk of osteopenia, osteoporosis, and risk of fractures. Fertility and pregnancy. Loss of fertility is one of the key accompanying features of, of POI. There was a study conducted, 358 consecutive women with idiopathic POI, 25% showed evidence of ovarian function, at least two consecutive menstrual cycles, the great majority within one year of diagnosis. Pregnancy occurred in 4.8%. Predictive factors included markers of ovarian activity at diagnosis and detection of ovarian follicles by the ultras by ultrasound. Now, long-term outcome of ovarian function in women with intermittent premature ovarian insufficiency. So you see that there is cumulative uh, you know, decline as she ages, there is decline in her fertility. So how do we diagnose this um, real uh, crippling unseen uh, uh, disorder in women? Now, primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea or spaniel menorrhea, more than four months, Two FSH values about 25 units per liter, low estradiol, normal prolactin, and normal TSH. So these are the normal um, parameters, estimations which we should uh, do to uh, label a woman of POI. Now, the personal history, physical examination, ovarian reserve, ultrasonography, and uh, antral follicle count, AMH for the women who's keen for conception. Then we go on with the karyotyping. Isolated POI. So AMH, ultrasonography, AFC, hormonal treatment, they can be subjected, whereas the defects in genes involved in follicular growth and functions possible ovarian reserve. So once it comes into the genetic uh, defects, then this may not be of great help. But at the same time, the specific cause like the toxic surgery and uh, these are one of the reasons of POI and uh, syndromic POI, like there are uh, under the unexplained POI, you have these familial DSD, goiters, candidiasis, Edison, so that the whole plethora of uh, uh, different uh, disorders which are seen in the syndromic POI. Genetic and therapeutic. Now, how do we uh, tackle with these patients? What is the approach? Genetic and therapeutic counseling, patient as well as the relatives, multidisciplinary team. In case the woman is willing for the fertility preservation, we uh, ask them for the oocyte cryopreservation or if the, uh, the reserve is very less, then we give them an option of egg donation. And uh, later, yes, once her fertility uh, aspect is addressed, then we uh, ad uh, did, uh, address with the osteoporotic and cardiovascular diseases that has to be protected from. Now, as POF has cumulative negative effects over time, it is important for the clinicians to make a timely diagnosis and begin appropriate strategies. Now, in case she presents with uh, a genital dryness, vaginal dryness, urogenital symptoms, and uh, 
you have hot flashes. These, these uh, symptoms have to be de uh, dealt with symptomatic management. Emotionally, yes, she has to give a lot of, the family has to be counseled, the, the woman has to be counseled, and a lot of emotional support is given to deal with the situation. And later, she is, as she is getting into more and more osteopenia, osteoporosis, increased fracture risk, that part of the, uh, the bone health has to be managed. Now, treatment to help prevent osteoporosis and relieve hot flashes and other estrogen deficiency. Estrogen is typically prescribed and uh, along with the progesterone. Adding progesterone protects the lining of, your, of the uterus from the precancerous changes caused by taking estrogen alone. In older women, long-term estrogen plus progesterone therapy linked to an increased risk of heart and blood vessels. In younger women with premature ovarian failure, however, the hormone replacement for heart health may pose potential risk. Now, there are two aspects. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. We are trying to protect the women from cardiovascular diseases. At the same time, now the progesterone, the hormone supplement will put her, put the women uh, more towards the stroke risk of stroke. Sex hormone replacement in ovarian failure. We need to uh, take a detailed family history as to her mother, her uh, first blood relatives, uh, what was the age of average age of menopause. We have to exclude pregnancy because there is a remote chance of spontaneous conception in premature ovarian failure patients. Now, appropriate evaluation should be considered in women who are amenorrheic for three or more consecutive months. Initial investigations should include the uh, different uh, hormone levels, FSH, LH, estradiol, thyroid, and prolactin. Now, AMH may be considered in these women for the assessment of follicular reserve. Hormonal replacement therapy should be used at least until the average age of menopause. Consider that COC may not be the best choice despite being peer friendly. Now, breast screening at an earlier age than current screening program advises should be assessed on an individual basis. Hormone therapy in POI. Estrogen, 1 to 2 milligram, micronized, 17 beta estradiol orally. Then you put them on continuous progesterone or sequential progesterone. Sequential in the last 12 days of the cycle. Every month you supplement the sequential 10 milligram medroxy progesterone daily for 12 days each month. 100 microgram of transdermal. One is the oral route, transdermal. These are uh, uh, 17 beta estradiol, orally conjugated uh, equine estro estrogen, 0. 0.6 to 5 milligram. We can put them on uh, micronized progesterone orally, 100 milligram or continuous or sequential. So this is what the therapy to be given where the unopposed estrogen is uh, supplemented with the uh, progesterone in a continuous or a sequential method. Ishway guideline management of women with pre POI. HRT is indicated for the treatment of symptoms of low estrogen in women with POI. Women should be advised that HRT may have a role in primary prevention of diseases of cardiovascular system and bone protection. 17 beta estradiol is preferred to ethnyl estradiol or conjugated for estrogen replacement. Women should be informed that while she has the advantages to micronized natural progesterone, the strongest evidence of endometrial protection is for oral cyclical combined treatment. Now, according to ISHRE guidelines, we have even estrogen substitution 
in adolescent girls. 12 to 13 years, if no spontaneous development and FSH is elevated, we put them on low dose estrogens. 17 beta estradiol is the uh, drug of choice, transdermal or oral. From 12.5 to 15 years, gradually increase the dose of E2 at 6 to 12 months interval over 2 to 3 years to adult dose. 14 to 16 years, they are put on cyclic progesterone after 2 years of estrogen or when breakthrough bleeding occurs. Oxidative stress. This in turn causes uh, damage to DNA, RNA, protein, and lipids, chromosomal instability, gene mutations, altered gene expression. So this is the impact of oxidative stress, like conditions like endometriosis, peritoneal environmental, and oxidative stress. They uh, hasten the process of atresia of the follicles. Can coenzyme Q10 supplementation protect the ovarian reserve against oxidative damage? So there's a study being done. So protective effect of resveratrol against oxidative damage to ovarian reserve in female, that study was done, which was done in rats. So yes, CoQ10 has shown some uh, protection against the oxidative stress. So women uh, who are into POI going in for infertility treatment, yes, we can consider them into uh, protect, uh, putting them on these uh, uh, molecules of uh, uh, CoQ10 enzyme. The playing field is changing. Fertility preservation technique depends on patient's age, cancer type, treatment type, time available, likelihood of ovarian metastasis. Now, oocyte embryo preservation is one option. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation and transplantation. In vitro oocyte maturation, primordial and preantral follicle culture. Uterine transplantation, ovarian suppression with GnRH agonist therapy. Fertility preservation for, there's another paper about fertility preservation for patients with cancer. Assessment of risk for infertility, communication with the patient is, that's what we need to discuss and counsel the patient as well as the uh, relatives and the family members. Patient at risk for treatment-induced infertility. So then we give them, refer to the specialist with expertise in fertility preservation methods. You have the males, sperm cryopreservation. Females, they have embryo or oocyte cryopreservation and conservative gynecologic surgery. So different methods like embryo freezing, oocyte cryopreservation, immature oocyte cryopreservation, ovarian tissue cryopreservations are the different options available. So this is a new ray of hope for patients with POI. And that is why we need to emphasize that these women need to be picked up early rather than putting them on to ovulation inducing agents and exhausting their uh, number of follicles. Mature oocyte cryopreservation, a guideline in patients facing infertility due to chemotherapy or gonadotoxic therapies, oocyte cryopreservation is recommended with appropriate counseling, more widespread clinic-specific data on the safety and efficacy of oocyte cryopreservation in donor populations are needed before universal donor oocyte banking can be recommended. There are not yet sufficient data to recommend oocyte cryopreservation preservation for the sole purpose of circumventing reproductive aging in healthy women. So embryo cryopreservation is another option apart from oocyte cryopreservation.
ovarian tissue cryopreservation. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation should not be offered to patients for benign conditions or for the purpose of delaying childbearing because it is still in the experimental procedure. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation and subsequent transplant may be offered to carefully selected patients as an experimental protocol. Cancer and fertility preservation, the international recommendations, what again comes as uh, the protocols may be administered in subfertile, infertile women with increasing risk of breast cancer, the long-term use of CC outside the current limited indications. So the different pregnancy in cancer survivors after adequate treatment and follow-up should not be discouraged. So we should discuss a woman who's undergoing uh, fertility aspects for women undergoing uh, the cancer treatment and fertility preservation. Activation of dominant follicles is a new treatment for premature ovarian failure. Cryopreservation, preparation of ovarian strips, laparoscopic ovarian ovariectomy for POF patients, fragmentation of ovarian strips to cubes. And that's how the ovarian cube sculpture, uh, laparoscopic autologous transplantation, oocyte retrieval, and then IVF and embryo transfer. Differentiation of primordial germ cells from induced pluripotent cells of primary ovarian insufficiency. That different skin by POI patients, skin biopsy, primary cells reprogramming, transpactin, and that's how the whole cycle of uh, POI specific phenotype essay has been. This is actually mainly into the uh, research in an experimental protocol. So different germ cells from the adult mouse and human ovaries, they are still in the experimental protocols. Now, most important, uh, most significant aspect of POI is bone health in women. The effect of POI associated estrogen deficiency on bone is most clearly established adverse consequences of that. Women with POI have shown to have reduced BMD, possibly an increased risk of fracture later in life. So we really need to counsel about the balanced diet, adequate calcium, vitamin D intake, um, uh, weight management, exercise, maintaining a healthy body weight and cessation and moderation of alcohol intake are primary goals in reducing the risk. How should health, uh, bone health be monitored? So by measurement of BMD, an initial diagnosis of POI, we need to do a BMD. And if it is normal, adequate systemic estrogen replacement commenced. And we need not, even just after supplementation, we need not do it every six months or a year. It can be repeated after five years. If diagnosis of osteoporosis is made and estrogen replacement therapy started, initiated, BMD measurement should be repeated within five years. Cardiovascular health. Many cohort studies have shown that women with natural POI, the age of 40 years, have earlier onset of coronary heart disease and increased risk of cerebrovascular disease mortality. So that is the reason that we need to pick up these women and protect them from strokes. Turner's syndrome, the higher prevalence of coarctic, aortic coarctation and bicuspid aortic uh, uh, regurgitation, more than double chance of developing coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, and increased risk of aortic dilatation and rupture. All patients with newly diagnosed Turner syndrome should be evaluated by the cardiologist and periodically monitored. 
So that's how the well-being and quality of life, a diagnosis of POI, POI has significant negative impact on the psychological well-being and quality of life. Psychological and lifestyle intervention should be accessible with POI. Routinely inquire about sexual well-being and sexual function with the POI. So the woman is really having uh, so much of emotional turmoil inside her. So it is, uh, it is the healthcare provider that we need to come forward and share and support her emotionally to overcome her psychological well-being disturbances. So uh, we conclude as to PIO, POI has widespread consequences for general health and fertility to investigate for the causes of POI. What is the reason as we have divided between idiopathic, autoimmune, and uh, most of them some uh, surgical, itrogenic, these are the different reasons and we need to find out that what is the reason, investigate uh, for the causes of POI, assessment of risk for POI, because women, is she at uh, heading towards the metabolic syndrome or going towards osteopenia, osteoporosis? Yes, we need to give her an option of fertility preservation. HRT is indicated for the treatment of symptoms of low estrogen in women. POI at least until the average age of menopause. Women should be advised that HRT may have a role in primary prevention of cardiovascular diseases and bone protection. We need to really counsel them as to uh, HRT. She will require uh, their balancing the risk and benefits. We need to make her understand as to, yes, this hormone, HRT, is going to give her uh, protection from the cardiovascular disease, disease and, and it will pro uh, protect her bone health. So let us all join hands in uh, facing and picking up these women and improving their quality of life and uh, reducing unexplained mortality in young women of POI. Thank you. Thank you for patient hearing. I once again thank no, Shield no, no. Connect team for giving me this opportunity to talk on such an interesting and uh, very important topic uh, in a woman's life uh, to uh, pick these women and uh, creating this uh, awareness amongst all our obstetrician and gynecologists. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation, ma'am. Uh, poor ovarian insufficiency is an important uh, limiting factor for the uh, success of any treatment modality in uh, infertility, ma'am. So early detection and uh, active management are essential to minimize the need of uh, egg donation in these women. It's always an honor hearing you, ma'am. Hope the participants also found this uh, webinar very useful. Uh, ma'am, if you allow me, then I will be reading out the questions, if any, in the comment box, ma'am. Sure. Uh, let me wait for one or two minutes for the participants to post their uh, uh, queries in the comment box. Um, if the AMH level is uh, below one and if the FSH and this histone level is normal, whether it uh, denotes this uh, poor ovarian insufficiency, ma'am? See, we need to assess the antral follicle count also. Okay. The In mm -hmm. some of the situations, like what we discussed is about the premature uh, ovarian failure or the primary ovarian failure, the women, uh, there is cessation of menopause, one aspect of it. There is another aspect, the women will continue to get her periods, but her follicles will have dysfunction and 
uh, they will be resistant to any sort of fertility treatment also in those. So along with AMH, estradiol, you need to go in, if she is going for a, a infertility treatment, we need to check with the antral follicle counts also. Okay, ma'am. And in uh, these ma women, even if they have the follicles, those follicles, it is the different studies in the previous paper, I just mentioned these women, these follicles are resistant to HMGs and recombinant FSH. So ma'am, whether the dosing of this HMG has to be individualized to the patients, ma'am? See, uh, in that situation, you can different, definitely give her an option of, uh, uh, you know, ART. And if she doesn't respond to that, then definitely egg donation. Okay, fine. Ma'am, uh, ma mother, uh, providing this DHEA will be beneficial in bringing out this... Uh, of course. Much lower, yes. yes, yes. The this is uh, DHEA is uh, definitely indicated for women with uh, you know poor ovarian reserve that has been beneficial. We have uh, given our in our day to day practice. Definitely DHEA is beneficial. And uh, what about these supplements like uh, leucine, ma'am? Uh, whether it will be uh, useful in activation of this. Uh, dormant follicles. Yeah, yeah. as uh, you, you know, we are dealing with a lot of uh, infertility patients also. And when we do the Doppler, the vascularity uh, uh, initially, when in the conditions with thin endometrium, we have seen that the vascularity is less. And so, one group of patients whom there is there is thin endometrium, but after supplementation of leucine for about uh, maybe three months or so, the vascularity has increased and they have shown better results. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, what about this uh, microdosing protocols in uh, this uh, when the patient is going for this uh, IVF, ma'am, like FAT treatments? Micro, sorry? Uh, microdosing, uh, microdosing of this um, HCG, and uh, there are some protocols which. Uh, yes, do this yes, thing. yeah. Different protocols you have to individualize according to the patient's, uh, you know, the parameters. You have to take into consideration is uh, there is, uh, you know, hypergonadotropic or hypogonadism into whatever uh, conditions. Definitely HCG is, is in the, uh, it has been tried in many of the centers, but uh, I really don't have uh, uh, much uh, uh, information about the HCG. It has been quite effective for uh, male infertility, HCG. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Giving 100 units every day has shown uh, in, uh, in men with, uh, you know, the sperm counts are low. So in those women, the counts have shown to be, have improved. Yes, ma'am. In some cases, this dual stimulation protocols are also uh, nowadays used in many places. Right. Yes. Uh, ma'am, I don't find any other questions in the comment box, ma'am. Uh, so if you allow us, then we can uh, end this webinar for today, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. It was a nice, very elaborative presentation, ma'am. Uh, thank you for spending your valuable time with us today, ma'am. On behalf of uh, Shield Healthcare, I would like to thank all the participants also for their uh, patient listening, ma'am. Uh, have a great weekend, ma'am. Thank you. Wish you all the same. Be safe. Stay safe. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much once again for an excellent session. And uh, we look forward for uh, your support, continuous support uh, in the times to come. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Yakaya. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Take care.